If you're just a Holiday Inn, what are you doing to generate extra revenue versus the Hampton Inn next door to you? Like nothing. Whatever one's newer and a little bit nicer, that's the one that's going to command the higher rate and people are going to stay at. At these bigger resorts, these life lifestyle hotels, I'm going to do a rooftop brunch. I'm going to open up and do like a comedy show in my bar. I'm going to have a hot DJ come in. There's so many more opportunities to generate revenue on the amenity side that will drive your room rate as opposed to these little transactional hotels that just aren't all that interesting. And to me, if you're going to invest in those commodity type hotels, you should probably invest in multifamily because you have guaranteed leases and there's a lot less risk. Like it's not worth the headache, in my opinion, to operate a commodity hotel unless you're such a good operator that it doesn't suck the life out and time out of you. Jake, welcome to the show. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's been great getting to know you over the last couple of years and enjoyed our breakfast this morning. I did too. All right. Jake is uh, a master of hotels, so we're going to talk a lot about it today. But I thought a fun question to start would be, you're in the hotel industry. Last night, you stayed at a cr- really cool hotel in Dallas. When you walk into a hotel, how do you experience it? Like, What are the things that you start noticing? I know what I start noticing when I get there, but what does someone that's that owns a lot of hotels start looking for as soon as they walk in? Yeah, you're going to put me on the spot. We didn't say the name of the hotel. You can say it if you want. Yeah. So I stayed at the Virgin last night and you know, Dallas doesn't have a lot of really interesting boutique and lifestyle hotels. So I wanted to stay at the Virgin to try it out. But what I realized coming into that hotel yesterday and some other hotels we toured before we came to Dallas is that I give my team a really, really, really hard time. And we do a lot of things really well. Okay. So one of the things I noticed is just my check-in experience was, you know, not as fun as I would have hoped it to be. It was way more transactional. It was very much like, okay, you're here to check in. And then they upsold me on an upgrade because my room wasn't ready. So that was like, I was kind of irritated about that. And, you know, I also heard the front desk person talking to her boss on the phone, asking how much they should, (laughs) you know, hit me up for the upgrade. And then I went over to the bar to have some lunch and the food was good. The space was cool. It wasn't that busy, but, you know, the bartender and the team didn't feel that engaged. They were kind of distracted and doing other things. So from a service standpoint, you notice all of those things right off the bat. There was a Four Seasons Hotel in Toronto that was, you know, the iconic Four Seasons Hotel. Four Seasons was founded in Toronto. And it was like this old kind of crappy building, but it was still amazing because it was a Four Seasons and the service was great. So service and the experience and how you're made to feel when you come into a hotel can cover up a lot of the design elements. Now, the design of the Virgin is great. It's really cool. It's a little kitschy. Everyone has their own taste. That was great. But like how you're made to feel is the most important thing. And it's the hardest thing to get right. So that leads me to a question. What is hospitality? What is the hotel industry to you? What does hospitality actually mean? Is it is it the way people make you feel? Is it how things look? Is it all of it together? Like what is hospitality? I think it's memories, it's experiences, all of the best things that have happened in my life, most of them have happened at a hotel or while on vacation, even on business. Like think about these major business events in your life. A lot of them involved a hotel. Maybe it was a big power breakfast. So it's really woven into the fabric of people's lives. But you know, we were recently touring this amazing new city where we're planning on making an investment. And there's some very like limited service hotels. And we're in this really cool city with like great bars and restaurants. And there are people like in some of these hotels sitting at the bar of the Hampton Inn. And I'm like, do these people just not get it? Like, do they just not care? Like, you know, do they not care about the quality of the hotel, the experience that they're getting? Are they immune to that? And maybe are we just totally different from them? So I'm not sure if it's my hospitality view is different from others, but that's what's most important to me because it's all of these memories and the things that I look back on and hotels that I want to take my kids to. That's what I think about. Can you make every, in today's world, it's hard to make everybody happy. It's hard to make everyone happy. It seems like the bar keeps moving and tastes change and and culture changes and just things change. Like, how do you think about that? Is your goal to make everybody that walks in happy or is there a certain 
um, target market that you focus on, or maybe you focus on all of them because you do different hotels. Like, how do you think about that? Because my buddies that run restaurants, I'll go on Google and like look at their reviews. And I'm like, man, I know how hard they work and how much time and energy, sweat and tears they put. And then you watch some jackass put like a one star review because maybe they had that one interaction with that grumpy waitress or waiter that day. And then they get hit with a one star review. You're kind of in that world. Taking a cue from fashion, you have to be focused with who you want to target. You know, Hermes, Chanel, Prada, they might not be for everyone. Maybe some people like Gap. Maybe some people like Old Navy. Maybe they like J. Crew. So I think hotels are the same thing. You got to focus in on who you're serving. I get in a debate with my dad all the time because he's like, I would never stay in a room like this. <laughs> well, of course, because you would never stay in a room like this. I'm not designing the hotel for you. I'm designing it maybe for someone 25 to 55. Yeah. But what we always try and do is if we we make it great so that even someone outside of that target demographic could appreciate it. But that's where like the service component layers in. Because if it's just the design, if it's just the experience and you're missing the service and really the whole package, then your target market is so narrowed down. Yep. All right. We're going to get really into hotels, but we we kind of jumped right in. Now let's take just one step back. You could have done anything you wanted and you chose to get into hotels. Why and how did you get into this business? Well, surviving COVID made me really think about like, whoa, <laughs> we're this is talk a real deal. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was always in the hotel business as a young kid. I worked with my dad. My dad was the hardest working guy you would ever meet. And he was at the time running two or three hotels and I would go work there on the weekends. And maybe it was just like an opportunity to hang out with my dad. Cause like we didn't really play sports and we didn't do all these activities together. So going to work in these hotels um, was something that I always grew up doing, but I always loved hotels. Like even as a little kid staying at these hotels, thinking about the design, experiencing different hotels. And I also knew that I wanted to get into real estate. It was just always a passion of mine. You know, family, friends growing up were in real estate and I saw that, but I thought hotels were the way to combine a real operating business with the fundamentals of real estate. And it just, it just happened. It was never a question in my mind that I wanted to do something else other than hospitality. I went to law school to become a lawyer with no intention of practicing law. And I just wanted to jump right into hospitality. And my path was trying to learn from others before I went out and did my own thing because I was always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I never wanted to work for like a big brand or even a big fund. I always wanted to do it on my own. And so as you sit today, how are the companies, you have two companies, how are they structured? And can you get a little bit of background about what each one does? Sure. So Warzak Hotel Group is our operating company. It manages the majority of the hotels that we own. And then Dove Hill is our investment and development platform. So we raise money from high net worth investors, institutional investors. So Dove Hill finds the deals, puts them together. And then they also have a project management and a construction group within that that executes on those deals. And during COVID, we started investing in other people's hotels that we didn't manage. There wasn't a management issue. So now Dove Hill has investments in, I think, 17 or 18 hotels. Oh, wow. And we only manage 10 of them. Okay. What does that look like if you just if you just invest in them? Just passive LP because you know the business? Are you involved? What does that look like? Well, it's during COVID. So these were preferred equity investments for the most part. In one case, we bought a note. Okay. And that was something we never had done before. But a guy that runs a very big institutional fund that maybe is a little bit of a mentor of mine, kind of early on in COVID, walk through this strategy. And what clicked is we are in a moment of time that will probably never happen again. And I have all these relationships in hospitality. We have the ability to raise capital. Let's go do these structured equity transactions in deals that we can underwrite with not a lot of brain damage. We know the market, we know the hotel, and we can go in in a preferred equity position and make a lot of money in a short amount of time. So we did that, but we invested in operators that we knew or had a relationship with that were good people on the ownership side. They had good management companies. They were just caught like everyone else in COVID with zero cash flow. Yeah. COVID sucked. Sucked. Especially for the hotel industry. So March 2020 comes. Like what, what kind of happens? 
uh, denial happens. So you really think that all this is just going to pass. And I have a group of about eight hospitality CEOs that I speak with very regularly. During COVID, we were talking every single week. And I became obsessed with trying to figure out all these government programs that were being talked about and how we could get cash to stay afloat. The other thing that was happening is hotels were closing. I mean, hotels don't even have locks on their doors. So like literally, how do you close a hotel? There's no, there's no lock. And I remember being in an executive meeting saying, hey, like some of my friends are talking about shutting down hotels because that's the only way to reduce cost as much as possible. And I remember my dad and some others in the meeting were like, no way, we're not closing a hotel. We're not doing that. And within three weeks, we had closed one or two hotels because that was the way to minimize and reduce cost. It was something that now looking back on it looks like a fog. I remember writing investor letters and I put like a big picture of uh, Muhammad Ali, like knocking some guy out and being like, hey, you know, we got punched in the face, but we're coming back. And we did come back. We didn't lose any hotels during COVID. We raised capital on our own deals. We put preferred equity out in other deals, but we had to like structure our own preferred equity in our own deals. Yeah. And that was interesting. And, you know, the, the toughest part about COVID is having everything you worked for, let's just say maybe 18, 19, all those deal returns, like literally just evaporated. Yeah. So in some cases you had to put more equity in deals. And in some cases you just had, didn't have cash flow for two or three years. You know, we just started distributing on certain assets. So when you're looking at IRRs and, and those sorts of things, they're going to look terrible. But I think that we are so much stronger and everyone in the hospitality industry who survived and thrived is going to be so much stronger. And anything we're facing now, like, okay, rising interest rates, sure, that's scary. It's not COVID. Yeah. We're not closing hotels because of rising interest rates. And I've also had a new appreciation for like negotiating with lenders. And everyone likes to think that as the equity, it's always your problem. It's your money. Well, you know what, Mr. Lender, we're in this deal together and we're partners. Sure, you might be debt and you're lower down in the capital stack or higher up in the capital stack, but we're in this together and we got to come up with a solution that works because you don't want my hotel. I don't want to give you my hotel. And if we have a little bit of time, we can get through this. And it gave me a new appreciation for standing your ground, being less accommodating. Also from an investor standpoint, you know, we had investors calling us, we had every single opinion in the book and you really had to be humble, be respectful, but they're paying me to make the decision. So I needed to be confident in the decisions that we were making and not waver. So it was a good lesson in leadership as well. Yeah, I've shared that same <clears throat> sentiment. I mean, working with lenders throughout COVID was, I just had a whole new appreciation. I felt like I learned a lot more about their business. I think it's like you said, a lot of times you think like you kind of take the money and you just hear these, you hear your whole life. Like if you don't pay them, it's over. They're coming after you, blah, blah, blah. You have a guarantee is, you know, it's your reputation. It's all these things. And it is all those things on the other end is like, if they want continued business and they can recognize there's a problem from a good borrower that's trying their best. I mean, we had such great rapport. We communicated really early, stayed in touch with them. And um, yeah, it gave me a whole new appreciation for their business. And it also, there was a couple lenders that made me realize like, I will definitely never want to work with them again. 100% like CMBS. Uh, I don't think we'll ever do a CMBS deal again because there is no one to talk to. And when you get someone on the phone, it's a 25 year old kid in Kansas that has no authority to do anything. And you're back channeling with the ultimate decision maker who's like typically a hedge fund in New York. And that becomes challenging. And that's not what real estate is about. That's really the financial side of real estate that um, is not going to create or add any value. And we want to focus on lenders that we can build a relationship with and get stuff done. Do you remember your worst day in COVID? Like not maybe business-wise or just you? I, I'll ask it from my perspective there. I don't remember the exact day. But it was shortly after, for me, you know, going into March, we had just put a big portfolio under contract. Industrial was all the rage. I mean, tons of bids on it. I mean, it was just, we were rolling. And within like three weeks, contract dropped, headlines like, don't pay your landlord. Like it was, 
such a black and like going from the top of the world to the bottom of the world uh, in so fast. It was so breathtaking. And there was like a 48 hour window where I was just not in a good spot. Um, Johnny, I've, we've talked about it on the pod before, but I would just, Johnny had to just listen to me just cry and bitch and scream and wham. And um, did you ever have a day like that? And, every, my, and my deal wasn't even near as bad as what happened to hotels. Every single day was getting punched in the face. I remember going, first of all, we had some cultural issues in our company that we were fortunately able to clean up through COVID in our, in our corporate entity. But I remember going to the office just by myself and we had to lay off like, you know, 700 people. I mean, it is just massive. So you're carrying around that guilt with you, but it was every day. There wasn't a specific moment. The best day was when we started doing deals and not sitting in the corner and crying anymore. Yeah, That was what I felt like I can survive anything and we can overcome anything. And there's always going to be challenges and issues in business, but it's really like how you deal with it. And a lot of people dealt with it negatively. I also realized that there's a lot of bad people out there. <laughs> and if you're a good person, you want to do well in business, I think you can distinguish yourself in the eyes of these lenders and some other people to get stuff done. Okay. So how has the industry changed post COVID? Like are, are there, are there fundamental things that will never go back? Is it kind of back to pre COVID? It just is what it is now. Or like what's changed? Uh, there are these like big behemoth box hotels that were kind of crappy before COVID, but now post COVID, they haven't had any CapEx put in them. They're just so big and lifeless. It's hard to imagine why people are going to stay there, why companies are going to want to host their event there. So that concerns me. There's certain cities that I am very concerned about because I don't think, you know, even talking to people about living there, they're like concerned for their safety. The vibe is just gone. So I want to, moving forward, really focus on things that are more in our control. And when you have like city, government, all this other crap going on, that's a real big distraction. People could look at it as, a, as an opportunity, but everyone got so excited about Detroit and what's going on in Detroit now? Like, are you going to Detroit? Yeah. And people have been talking that for five years. So some of these cities might not come back to where they were. And we have hotels in our portfolio that are still not back to pre-COVID levels. I think eventually Why? over time they get there because revenue, like we're still missing a huge amount of business. One hotel, government isn't even traveling. So you're still needing to do a COVID test if you have a government event. Like a government <laughs> event would be like Lockheed Martin and Rolls Royce. It's not just a bunch of army people. And that just seems so backwards to me. There are you know, less business travelers maybe because more people are on Zoom. Now on the flip side to that, we're seeing a lot more corporate retreats. But if you want to be inspired and have a corporate retreat somewhere, you're not going to this big, bland, boxy hotel with nothing, with these ballrooms and no windows and no fresh air. So the hotels that are going to win out, I think are really going to be the ones that are differentiated in the lifestyle. The commodity hotels on the smaller end are going to be fine because they almost double like workforce housing. Is there any, yeah, so maybe you just answered the question. Is there anything to do with those big boxy bland hotels? Like, do you turn them into a better hotel or do you just ditch that and change product type altogether? Some of them you can turn into the better hotel. Like I think if you ask Marriott, they would say we are the best renovator of crappy Sheridan hotels. We've taken two Sheridan hotels that were the worst in the market, in their entire portfolio and made them some of the best hotels in their portfolio. So there are some opportunities, but sometimes like the bones are just bad and the spaces are bad. So I have some friends that are converting hotels right now, like these big ones into multifamily and apartments. Like you can, you know, take a big ballroom and now you can add like squash courts and a basketball court. And this thing becomes like an amazing multifamily site. But I think office is going to have similar challenges. Yeah, Some of them might get knocked down. Okay. What are you doing to convert? You said you're converting Sheridans to Marriott's? Sheridans to just better Sheridan. So we're not doing that anymore. We don't have that, but we've done two of them. And Sheridan was this old brand that kind of got stale and they revitalized it in an amazing way. We have a Sheridan outside of DC where the room is like nicer than 
you know, any lifestyle hotel, like it, the product looks phenomenal, but you still have the name Sheridan, which I think in some people's eyes might be a challenge. Marriott's been working incredibly hard to overcome that, but there is an opportunity to go in and renovate these hotels. It's just at what basis you have to look at your entry point. Okay. So, and, and I think I know the answer to this question. It's kind of like, there's lots of different cars, but you hear Sheridan, uh, Holiday Inn, Hampton Inn, da 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 what differentiates any of them nothing just a different name it's kind of like a corolla versus a hyundai versus a whatever they're starting to get so commoditized and it's taking the fun out for me as an investor and i think our company certainly is starting to move way more into lifestyle and these highly differentiated assets because there's multiple levers that we can pull to generate revenue if you're just a holiday inn what are you doing to generate extra revenue versus the Hampton Inn next door to you? Like nothing. Whatever one's newer and a little bit nicer, that's the one that's going to command the higher rate and people are going to stay at. At these bigger resorts, these life lifestyle hotels, I'm going to do a rooftop brunch. I'm going to open up and do like a comedy show in my bar. I'm going to have the hot DJ come in. There's so many more opportunities to generate revenue on the amenity side that will drive your room rate as opposed to these little transactional hotels that just aren't all that interesting. And to me, if you're going to invest in those commodity type hotels, you should probably invest in multifamily because you have guaranteed leases and there's a lot less risk. Like it's not worth the headache, in my opinion, to operate a commodity hotel unless you're such a good operator that it doesn't suck the life out and time out of you. So in, in in that type of hotel, what would make an amazing operator? Like what makes the star shine in that hotel class? Like what is good operating look like in a commodity? I know we can talk about what it looks like in lifestyle where it's great service, you know, five-star service, but what does it look like at like a Holiday Inn? I love that question. I think the biggest thing in those hotels is revenue management. And that's setting your daily rate and the strategy around that okay. because it is so important. The next thing is automation. How can you automate certain things inside of your hotel and standardize certain operating line items where there's zero deviation from the hotel team? Like, you know, you're buying toilet paper at the same price as everyone else uh, and you don't have to think about it. You maybe have limited front desk staff because everyone's checking in with keyless entry, like those sorts of things. And then maximizing what those hotels do have and what people do like about those hotels. So if you're serving free breakfast, well, it better be the damn best free breakfast that you can get. And everyone likes a bar. So why don't you try and do somewhat of an inspired bar? Because you're going to have captured audience. Like we were just in this, the coolest town. And people were at like the Staybridge bar. You know, yeah. there are people that just don't care and they want to be there. So do a good job at it is something that I think it's important. I had uh, a friend I was talking to the other day and these commodity hotels are starting to pull things from lifestyle hotels. So they're starting to take like, you know, good coffee. They're starting to take like a curated art program, all this nonsense. So I think what you really have to focus on is the operational metrics and KPIs and have a very defined set of things that you're measuring against to decrease decision-making of the on-property team. First question out of that, how, who's setting the daily rate? Is this a computerized program that's like like what they do in, in multifamily where it's constantly updating by the hour or is it by the day or the week? You're not going to believe this. It is crazy. So the biggest brands, Hilton and Marriott, you have to set your rates through their systems. And they and, charge you for that. Yeah, they charge you, but the systems are so antiquated. Like they have like rate bucket categories. So like, you know, maybe they have eight rate categories, $100, $120, $130. Not like that incremental stuff. So we have people, revenue managers that are literally looking at data and information and changing those rates hour by hour and daily. But I think this is such a big opportunity for AI to layer on heavily. So someone's overseeing it and viewing it, but they're pulling in data from thousands of different sources to inform what these rates should be like, I don't know, Google movement data. If there's a snowstorm and the airport's closed, like it should automatically trigger, you know, jacked up rates. The other thing that 
we see in hospitality, it's hard to figure out what other hotels are charging because the rate that you see on a website is the rate that like Chris is getting booking the same day, day of, but it's not the rate that they might be charging to the Chris Powers conference that's booked in the hotel. So it's really hard to know what their occupancy is and what their rate is. And there's services that you can get maybe on a 24 hour basis, on a weekly basis, monthly basis to see how you're competing. But there's still a lot of uh, challenges to setting rate. And that's the biggest opportunity. That's crazy to me because you said that Hilton uses, I know the multifamily, I can't remember what it's called. It's called something star or something, but it changes them by the minute. You said KPIs. Uh, I know what's RevPAR? Revenue per available room. Isn't that like the KPI? This is the big metric. So it's not just revenue per available room, but you want to look at what your revenue per available room is compared to your other hotels that you're competing against. And revenue per available room is made up of your rate and your occupancy, you just multiply the two and, and you get rev par. Yeah. The index is how you compete against the other. So 100% is you're getting your fair share of the business. 120%, you're getting like 20% more than the business. So you want to be above 100%. If you're not above 100%, you got to try and figure out why. And that comes back to like good old sales and revenue management technology. But that's the measure that I look at every month to figure out if my team is doing what they're supposed to be doing or if we have a problem. Is there anything else you look at? Like, obviously that tells a story of what's going on. Then you dive deeper into if there is an issue, but what other KPIs, especially at these more commoditized hotels, would they be looking at? Yeah. So that's just revenue. So you want to look at your GOP. You want to look at how your GOP is comparing to prior years. And you also want to look at something called flow through. Okay. So if you had a budget and let's just say your payroll is expected to be $100,000 and maybe that's based on $200,000 of revenue. Well, let's just say the market went crazy and your revenue jumped up to 300,000. What flow through is, is how much of that extra $100,000 of revenue are you bringing down to the bottom line as profit? Mm. So in order to get that hundred grand, which was just in rate, did you like, I don't know, hire a bunch more housekeepers or something, and no. then you're not flowing anything or are you flowing everything? So that's a really key metric. The other one is labor efficiency and booking. Like how big is your sales team relative to the amount of revenue that they're generating and how does that compare to a hotel? Another thing we look at is net operating income per key. So some amazing hotels in South Beach generate $80,000 of net operating income per key. We have some hotels that are doing $20,000 of net operating income per key. It's like, okay, well, why aren't I as profitable? It's probably because your revenue is not big, but it's also because maybe you're missing opportunities on ancillary revenue items that you're not executing on, like resort fees. The president just came out and said he wants to get rid of resort fees. (laughs) That hotels are charging $90 a night and he's got to get rid of it. Uh I mean, that's what we're focusing on right now. And um, I can tell you that the two hotels I stayed at the past two nights, I paid resort fees and it's just, you know, I got a couple of bottles of water and it is what it is. It's the cost of the hotel room and it's, it's not that big of a deal. There's much bigger fish to fry. Right There's now. much bigger fish to fry right now. Um, but labor is the most expensive thing in a hotel. So we look very much at labor efficiency. And the, the interesting thing right now in hospitality is housekeepers are hard to come by. You know, we have immigration issues. These are, were low paying jobs. Now they're actually pretty high paying jobs, but most hotels today are using what's called contract labor. And this is the dirty secret in the hospitality business because you're paying a company to give you employees. Those might be employees that you couldn't hire directly otherwise, and you're paying them a much higher wage but that wage is just going to the contract company and then the employee is getting whatever they're getting, but that's raising the expense in your hotel. So what we're trying to do is figure out how do we retain people? How do we create a culture that people, you know, where people want to show up to work every day, clean rooms, it's a really hard job. And how do we attract talent? If you want to talk about like the big macro stuff, there's certain programs like the J1 program where you can get amazing hospitality students internationally to come work in the hotel. They do a tremendous job, 
but we should probably have some sort of a work visa program too to help fill some of these jobs that are getting filled by people uh, anyways. Could you, has anybody ever thought of like, if the guest was like, hey, I'll check this box. You don't have to clean my room while I'm here. And maybe you guys say, great, we'll give you $50 discount or something. Yeah, so you should be in the hotel business because 100%. See, I, I'm, I think you know. I'm getting in. I think this, yeah. is, this is my entry point. The hotel business is fun because this is why there's so many levers you can pull to create an operational advantage. And that might be one of them. During COVID, we are like, yeah, we're not cleaning rooms because of COVID. Some of that actually stuck. I'm a traveler that doesn't need my room to be cleaned if I'm traveling on business for two or three days. I don't want anyone in my room. Yeah. So I would check that box, give me a free drink, and that would be a huge savings. The hotel industry has moved into like light cleaning, soft touch cleaning, which is like make the bed and freshen up the towels. That's it. Uh, it won't work in luxury hotels, but in four star hotels, hundred percent. I'm gonna get a, a. I'm gonna put a sign on a picket, go in front of your one hotel, and yes, and picket. Check the box. Don't do cleaning. That yeah, you might you know in some of these locations there'll be union picketers out front too, so you'll be in good company. Good, <laughs> but um, it's it's a great um. It's just a great opportunity to save money because a lot of people don't use all the things that hotel offers. And that would be one way that you could do it technologically through an app and you could just pick whatever you want, what you don't want. We'll get to lifestyle in a minute, but we're talking labor and we're talking resort fees. And the only thing that's coming to my mind right now is Airbnb. Like you, I see on Twitter, like people will post like all the expenses about, uh, of, of having an Airbnb and clearly like not all short-term rentals are Airbnbs, but from somebody that's in the hotel industry, how do you think about Airbnb and do, are any, are some of these just never going to be profitable? And it's a like the, the industry is getting away from some people and they're going to have to specialize into something that looks more like a hotel than an Airbnb. I'm talking too much, but you know kind of what I'm saying. It's all about scale. You know it in your business. And what I think the most important trend to come out of Airbnb is that people like a differentiated experience and people also like staying in like a house or a condo, especially if you're with a family that's very appealing. So I think as we build new hotels or buy hotels, we've looked at like adding Airstream trailers, tra trailers and adding tents and maybe making larger family suites and different things like that. But I think why people fell in love with short-term rentals is because the barrier to entry is incredibly low. You could buy a house, you can manage it and make a little bit of money, and maybe it's like a vacation home and that's offsetting some of the costs. But if you're going to make a business out of it, there is just no scale like we can get in a hotel because you're paying some regional manager to manage like five things in a market or you're spreading like corporate overhead costs across all these different markets, but you still have to deal with cleaning people and maintenance and engineering, and you can't afford to have those people on full-time staff. So I think it's like a fun little side hustle. Sure. But I've yet to see the big monster short-term rental. And maybe uh, our friend Richard Fertig will yeah. come up with that and do that. But I think what he's doing is a little bit interesting yeah, he's because different. he's making bigger um, places for meetings and retreats, which is an opportunity to upsell people and you can offer certain amenities and they'll pay for that. But if someone's renting a house from you, they're paying for the house and they're not paying for anything else. Right. So there's no leverage to extract there. And Airbnbs, like people were freaking out about it, but it's honestly not something that we talk about anymore as being something that we're concerned about. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about, uh, we can talk about lifestyle. Um, how do you, how do you define lifestyle? Oh my God, this is so hard. Like, I don't even know what term to use anymore. Like boutique hotel lifestyle. It's kind of funny. Every time I talk lifestyle, there's like a swinging lifestyle. And I always get nervous that like <laughs> people are going to think about that. Um, that's why people love your hotels. Yeah, that's your target the, market. We're baby. the swinging central. Yeah. Of, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what we're known for. 
So lifestyle and boutique, I think this all comes down to highly differentiated, curated, handcrafted, high design, and most importantly, experiential base. So like you're going to have an emotional connection with the property. You're going to remember it. You're going to feel like it's your home. That is the ultimate goal. And I think that's what that segment is, but it could be a lot of different quality types. Like you can have a lifestyle hotel that maybe is a five-star hotel. I think most luxury hotels, I would kind of classify also as lifestyle, but you could have a three and a half and a four star, like a hip motel. I would also classify as a lifestyle hotel. Okay. Uh, besides y'all, who is the greatest uh, person in the industry at creating places that people are attached to and creating experiences that people can't forget? Or who who are the companies or folks that you admire the most that do this the best? This is an easy answer. I mean, my good friend, Barry Sternlicht is the master at creating experiences, creating hotels, but also building companies that make money and making very incredible real estate investments attached to these hotels. I mean, he's built some, he built W, he built one, these iconic brands. Uh, there's also Schrager and Andre Balas, these people have paved a way for everyone else in the industry to kind of get started and understand the foundation. Liz Lambert from Texas is yeah. another one. She's all over Austin. Her design, what she was doing with kind of these like existing buildings and turning what was like a crappy dive, you know, drug den motel into something special is really interesting. A buddy of mine, Jeff Klein in LA, has the hottest members club in LA. And that all came from this iconic hotel that he owns called the Sunset Tower Hotel, which originally was like kind of not on the outskirts of town, but in an area of West Hollywood that was just okay. But he created this iconic restaurant where all the celebrities wanted to be and the hotel was great. And then now he created this members club, which is like a new category that's popping up that a lot of hotels are doing because you can charge all these people a lot of money to be members. And then that just offsets like a huge amount of your GNA on the PL, which is pretty interesting. That is super interesting. So it's almost like a Soho house, but you can stay there type deal. Yes. Or you could not stay there. You know, again, this is my friend in LA. He wanted to create a new Soho house because he once saw his dentist at Soho House, and that wasn't cool. So Soho House became this massive public company. There's a lot of members. They are some of the best in the business. I think it's hard to find someone that combines a membership experience, food and beverage, and hotels better than they do it. But there's always going to be these people that create these little exclusive enclaves. But again, how do you scale that? So that might just be a one great experience in one city and that's it, which is fine. But Soho House has found a way to do it all over the world, which is incredibly impressive. And I think they are a master of what they do. Are like companies like Four Seasons, Ritz Carlton, St. Regis, kind of the big known luxury, are they still the cool ones or are there all these emerging brands that are overtaking them? Because you've just mentioned all these names like I've never even heard of. But even now, I feel like when I'm scrolling, I stayed at the one in Miami, which was incredible. We can talk more. We're going to talk about Barry in a second. But um, how do you think about Four Seasons, St. Regis? Are they getting older and tired and there's a new brand or are they refreshing and they're always going to be the kings? I think Four Seasons is the best in the business at luxury and consistency. There's a few other brands like Belmond would be another one that's heavy in Europe. There's a few in the United States that just hit it so well. Each hotel has their own identity. Uh, Ritz-Carlton and St. Regis are owned by Marriott now, and I think they're starting to get a little bit more sterile. Four Seasons, because it's they just do one thing, luxury, they've maintained this very high arc. But there's some cool other ones like Amon and Rosewood that are very different, and they each have their own way of doing things like Auberge is now starting to have all these like kind of retreats and their hotels are really set in scenery and design. There are exciting hotel companies. And once they get to a certain point, 
Then they get a bunch of rich developers saying, I want that hotel and I'm going to build that. So they're able then to compound this because growing a hotel company is hard because you got to find the real estate, you got to create the brand, you got to do it right. And for a lot of these places, location is everything, experience is everything. So it's not like, you know, class B industrial. You could just say, hey, that stuff is everywhere. It's kind of the same. I'm going to buy it. It's got to be exactly the right magic. Okay. You just said rich developer find site. So let's kind of now move into like how you underwrite, think about things, how you raise money. Um, what did you mean by rich developer finds a site? Do they just find a site and say, uh, found the site? Hey, Four Seasons, I'm going to build all the real estate and you're going to operate. You're going to basically sign a lease with me. Like, how does it work? They, so in the case of that, and there's other companies, it's not just Four Seasons, but everyone wants to own a hotel because it's typically a great investment because in good times you're generating all this cash flow. But it's one of the only real estate asset classes where you can go inside, live it, breathe it, share it with your friends, stay there. Like, you're not going to hang out in your class B industrial <laughs> set, right? Any friends I'm taking to hang out there, uh, it's it's more for punishment than for <laughs> for uh, hanging out. Although I had fun at Carbone last night and that was like a warehouse. So it, I think there's a, you have a future in doing some amazing I agree. lifestyle industrial spaces. Many calories have been killed at Carbone's for me. Uh, I bet. There. It's, it's awesome. It's good. So typically you'll have a developer who wants to bring in a hotel because there's going to be a compounding effect. Maybe he owns other real estate around there. The other thing that that adds is if he's trying to sell condos or she's trying to sell condos, the hotel name and the service and the experience will add a level of prestige that will help drive those sales. So that's one way. And then they sign a deal with a well-known management company. They'll brand it, they'll create it. And they're just like a hired manager. So they get paid a fee. It's normally 3 to 4% of revenues. And then all of the expense, all of the profit goes to the ownership. Maybe there's a little bit of profit sharing at the bottom. What we do is a little bit different because we're vertically integrated. So we find the investment, whether it's a development deal or an acquisition deal. And oftentimes we will create the brand, we will create the business plan, and then we'll layer in our management company on top to go execute. Okay. So we've been growing and it's hard because we have to find the real estate and then go do the deal. We're now getting to the point where our management company has scaled so much where we are talking to other people about doing what we do for ourselves for others, whether that's managing their hotel, maybe it's joint venturing on a deal. Someone owns the land. They want to build a hotel. They don't have the expertise. Those are some great deals that we've gotten into where you have a smart real estate investor, wants a hotel we'll invest, we'll manage and uh, execute, help them get debt, put the deal together, design it. And it's a tremendous value add because if you're not in hospitality, it's really hard to do it on your own. Is managing tough if you are managing lots of different brands? Like does each brand require you to manage differently? So you have to learn all these different playbooks or is it all pretty much the same? It's all pretty much the same, but they all have their own little brand standards and the things that they do. But we like to have the Wurzak way, yeah. Wurzak Hotel Group. We want to do it in our way, which is always a little bit elevated. It was interesting because again, like I was at these couple hotels the past few days. And I'm like, man, I give my team a hard time. Like we actually do things really well, but like in all businesses, you have to have a little bit of tension yeah. with your operating team, your designer, your architect to really make the magic happen. Yeah. Um, okay. So we, we, you find a good site. What do y'all look for? Like, what are you looking to buy? There's lots of hotels out there. Obviously, what are the ones that check your box? Assuming, um, you know, good price. We'll, we'll skip over the like, well, it's just really cheap. I could buy it for a great price. What, what is a, something you would want to hold forever? So that's, that's like a totally different category. We, we have really three strategies right now. Let's talk Basically about it. it's discounted purchase price value add execution. We're going in and buying an asset that currently exists, that we're getting at a good price, that we think we can significantly improve revenues by upgrading the management, doing a value add renovation, repositioning some area of the hotel to create value, might be adding a bar by the pool. It might be redesigning the lobby so it doesn't look like you know something out of a uh, 90s furniture catalog. And that's one strategy. The second strategy is these lifestyle and boutique hotels. And that's really converting 
an existing building or an existing hotel into something that's highly differentiated, that's going to outperform the market because everyone wants to be there, that has a big food and beverage component tied to it, that is very design forward. It's either independent, like it's not affiliated with Hilton or Marriott, or maybe it's a soft brand, but it's not a Marriott, Weston, Doubletree, Hilton, something like that. And then the third strategy is structured equity. So right now, capital is very much available. Debt is a challenge. We can come in, provide gap equity, add strategic value as a partner, don't need to take control. We know the asset, we know the market, we're coming in, we're deploying capital in a very specific way where we're getting a preferred return before the common. And it actually, in some cases, enables the common to get an outsized return because our return might be capped. So that is three. The fourth is compact full service development. Okay. Building these big master resorts take a lot of time, a lot of money. There's a lot of risk. By the time you get done with one of them, you could have missed the market. There could have been a lot of things that happened during that time. So compact development is something we like because you can build a hotel within two years. It doesn't have these big, massive ballroom spaces where you're worried, like, am I going to fill this? There's a great bar. There's a great rooftop bar. The room sizes are great. And it's like right woven into the neighborhood. So from a development standpoint, that's where we're focusing on. In the next three years, though, I want to buy a never sell asset, which is this iconic asset that could never be reproduced, could never be built again, might be because construction costs are too crazy. The location is just never going to come up again. But it's always going to be a hotel that you can just add a little bit to, add a little bit to, add a little bit to, and constantly drive value for a generation or multiple generations. What's a soft brand? A soft brand is when you want to leverage the power of a Hilton or a Marriott, but you want to have your own identity. So we have a soft brand in Fort Lauderdale called the Dalmar. We created the brand, we created the logo, we created the soaps and the scents and everything about the design. And we picked the mattress and the sheets and all the fun stuff but it's tied into Marriott. So we get this power of this big distribution system. We're looking at a deal right now in the Southeast and we want to do it independent. We don't want a brand. And the beauty to that is we think the market's strong enough where we don't need that extra fuel, but you can always add a brand in later. So if we think we maybe want to get a little bit extra and a brand wants to participate, we can always add that. But you can't take a brand away once you start with it. It's really hard. You got to pay you know, liquidated damages and get in a whole fight. So you can always add it. It's really hard to get rid of it. And to get in with these brands, do you have to prove that you've run a hotel before? Like if I were to call Hilton, I've never, I've been in real estate for a long time, never run a hotel. And I was said, Hey, I want to buy this in Hilton. I want you to manage it. What would they tell me? Oh, they'd say, Chris, you're our new best friend. Oh, really? Yeah. So if you're going to let Hilton manage it, all day long, they're going to help you do that. If you said, hey, we've got like this industrial management team, they're world-class, we're going to have them manage the hotel, they'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We need to understand your company a little bit more. There's probably no way we're going to allow you to manage it. You can franchise it and you can either hire us to manage it or you can call your buddy Jake and have him manage the hotel for you. So we are now getting inbounds from other owners, developers, to either participate on the deal on the equity side and manage or just manage third party, which is is great. Okay. Speaking of management, you said one of the ways you add value is upgrading management. And and I'm look and I'm going through my notes and I'm seeing like upgrading uniforms, upgrading how they greet you when they're there. So let's kind of talk about training and what upgrading management looks like. So we just bought this a hotel. is like the hardest part of the industry. It's it's hard. We just bought a hotel. And it was owned by a group that owns a couple other hotels, but they don't have the best reputation and their company culture is not that strong and they're just going through the motions. So for example, we're walking through the hotel, we're meeting the staff, the staff seems great, they seem engaged. Mm -hmm. And then we see this massive pile of checks like leaving the accounting office. You know, what's that? that? By the way, that was us five years ago. 
oh, we send all the checks every week to the home office here. They sign and they send them back. Then we mail them out. Like just doesn't make any sense. Waste a whole bunch of time. We go into the employee cafeteria. Oh, you know, we, we charge all of our employees, you know, $3.90 for lunch every day. Who's making money on $3.90? <laughs> like that just shows you right there that you can win all of these employees over by paying them a fair wage, but giving them free lunch. Like we get free lunch at all of our hotels, free meals, crappy healthcare. That's an easy thing. That's just from the employee side. But then going in, looking at the menus, like, you know, we were touring and this. Do you ho- do this or do you have a team that does this? I have a team that does it, but I like get I get involved. You roll your sleeves up. I roll my sleeves up, but I also have a team that gets in the weeds. But every now and then I need to get in the weeds. Okay. So for example, in this one hotel, you know, we were walking through there doing a banquet. It they were serving like a McDonald's lunch. And it's just not how we would ever do things. There's certain vendors you work with, there's certain presentation. This company was stuck in the 90s, like these old big like silver things where people like scoop out a big hunk of mashed potatoes and (laughs) plop it on their plate. Like no one wants to eat like that anymore. Like (laughs) everyone wants to eat in like a, you know, charcuterie board and great salads and like how the normal world world works. These hotels are stuck in the 90s. (laughs) So changing that, going to the bar and adding a cool cocktail menu, like listening to the music, looking at the lights. Do you think you want to sit in a bar when it's this bright out? No, we got to dim our lights down at six o'clock. So those little touches to create the vibe and energy is key. And then it's, uh, you know, in some of our heavy lifestyle hotels, I'm going in for dinner, I'm going in for drinks and uh, my wife hates it, but I have my phone like right here next to my leg. Everything I'm seeing, I have a notes that I'm just, yep. and, uh, and the chefs always come out. And every time, most of the times, it's like, oh, chef, it was phenomenal. The food was great. I like this. I want to do this. Why are the uniforms a little off? Like, we need to fix that. The cocktails were great. You know, recently I went, the chef's like, how is everything? I'm like, you know what, chef? I wouldn't be doing you a service. I wouldn't be doing myself a service. Tonight was not your night. You let me down. It wasn't a good job. Okay. My wife almost slid under the table. <laughs> like, it was the most awkward (laughs) thing ever. Normally I reserve those conversations to my leadership team. Like I'll say, Oh, everything's great. And then I'll text, you know, either the CEO or the president of our company or someone on the operations team. Like you guys got to look into, you know, their glassware, the napkins aren't right. Or the food doesn't look right. This time I just wanted to say it. And it's important to have that personal touch because a lot of these management companies are getting so big and we went to the best hotel in this market we visited yesterday. And I was shocked at the way they were doing things. And I think they've gotten so big that they've lost this personal touch and they've lost the spirit of that personal touch ingrained in the culture of their company. Like, for example, you know, we walked in, there was a coffee shop right next to the restaurant and it was seven o'clock at night and the, and the little pastry case was filled with like croissants from the day earlier. So I'm looking, I'm like, God, that's going to be terrible because tomorrow when I go down for breakfast, they're going to give me this day old croissant that's just been sitting there. Like that's just a lack of care and attention. See, this is the fun of hospitality. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're getting into the weeds. It's into the weeds. Like I would ask you, who cares what the chef's uniform looks like? Why does that even matter? There's an old school charm to hospitality and people care about the presentation, they care about the look, they care about the service. And in some of our hotels, we have you know an amazing rooftop bar and we let the bartenders kind of wear their own thing. We don't want them in a uniform. We don't want them in like a polo shirt with like the name of the thing, like that's not cool. Like these guys have like sleeves and tattoos and like we want that all to come out in that personality. But we still have guardrails and a framework of what we want as a brand, as a company, and we put people in there. In some instances, like for certain uniforms, it's this and you can't deviate. So it really depends on the place, but it makes a difference. You do lots of surveys, I'm sure, with customers that are leaving. What are the things people mostly bitch about and what are the things that most people are really love? You know, it's tough, okay? Imagine if you had a trip advisor for all of your industrial tenants. 
and they could go on there and complain, rave, whatever they want to do about your spaces and your deals. Yeah. And your investors go look at that. Yeah. So every once in a while, we'll get a call and be like, wow, the scores are just so great at the the Delmar or the Hilton. W- what are you guys doing? Every once in a while, we'll get a call. You know, it seems like you guys got to check the AC in room 803. And I'm like, my God, like, this is why am I doing this? Yeah. But um, <laughs> the good thing is you get constant feedback and it's a measurable goal that you can assign the team to. So we opened a hotel and the guest service scores were not where they needed to be. So we we dug in, we did research, we found that it was really an issue at the front desk. The arrival experience wasn't right. And that starts with before the guest even gets the hotel, like, was the GM sending a welcome letter to people like, hey, I know you're coming to stay at the hotel. We have the pool party open this weekend. The rooftop bar opens Thursday. We have a great DJ. There's this new gallery in town that you should check out. Like that would make you excited to stay there versus when someone comes to the front desk and like, hey, are you here to check in? Like that's the worst thing, Yeah, you know, yeah. and that experience. So you can really measure that, but you have to then have the stomach and the execution capacity to go change things when they're wrong. The good thing is you get tremendous amount of positive reviews and we highlight those and we really do that with the staff. And we have a culture committee that in each hotel that their sole intention and purpose is to better the guest experience and also improve the lives of the team members. And they talk about how we can improve service, what's working, what's not working, and what we could do to make the team members feel better. Yeah. A lot of touchy-feely stuff. I and I mean, it, it, it seems to me, you know, it was like there was a year in COVID where everybody thought like, the days of service are over. Like people are just going to disappear. You're just going to walk into rooms and like press a button and that's going to be the experience. And I would argue we're probably getting more into touchy-feely stuff. The level of service and requirement for people to feel just continues to raise and raise and raise. And so it's why I have a ton of respect. It's why also probably for me personally, I'm like, I don't know if I could, it's a lot. Yeah. It's customized experience, but you could figure out what you want because you're a well-traveled guy. You go on vacations, you know what you like and yeah. you don't like. So you just do that, but you got to train people to do it, but you also got to show them the why, because if you just train them and they don't understand the end state and what the goal is, then they're going to be like in this weird scripted And the end state and the goal is making someone feel like this is their home, like they're staying at their coolest friend's house, like they feel like they want to belong and that they would want to come back. That is the goal. You raised money from uh, Mr. Starwood, Mr. Barry Sternlicht, and you also just said that he's also one of the uh, best, I guess we'd call him a hotelier in the industry. What's he better at, giving capital or building hotel brands or both? So we've done three deals with Barry and in two of them, he brought us in as a development partner to help him execute his vision. And that was an incredibly hard job because this guy has the best vision in the world for hospitality, but doesn't always have the bandwidth to do it himself. Yeah. But is also, when he leans in, becomes the most hands-on guy you've ever seen. Really? And in one deal, he kind of, he helped us out. Um, he came into an investment that's a phenomenal investment on very short notice. We had an investor that had some issue. They were taking 50% of the deal. We had hard money up and they couldn't proceed. It was like an internal issue on their side. And Starwood ended up coming into the deal and obviously they got great terms, but it's been a phenomenal partnership they operate on a totally different level than a lot of other people, but they're actually very entrepreneurial in a way. Like they're not as big from an acquisition and as investment team as you would think. And um, we've learned a lot from them just like they've learned from us. But one of the big things I've learned mm. from Barry, particularly on the execution side, is you got to trust your instincts. You have to be involved, but you also got to hire some great, talented people to do it when you're not there. And he's built this one brand, you know, out of one South Beach, out of nothing. 
And now it's taking over the world in a very differentiated way. Some deals they do with the fund and some deals they manage for others. But there is a big responsibility partnering with Starwood. Barry will call me and ask me how the hotel is doing. Like he knows. His team aggregates all this data and he wants to know how his investment's doing. He is not a passive investor. When you're around this guy, he is always working, always thinking, and he is very curious, very personable. And I think that's been part of the key to his success. Like I'm sure you've met successful people and they're just like weird to be around. He has the personal touch, but he can also execute and raise capital, you know, like no one else. How did you, he could have worked with anybody. How did this, how did this partnership come to be? Luck. Okay. So I was at a hotel in California with my family and um, I was talking to the concierge. We, We knew this hotel. We were talking to them about this new restaurant that I'd been to and I was yapping away. And, um, all of a sudden Barry like checks in and I kind of see him at the corner of my eye. I'm like, Oh shit. Like this is Michael Jordan. Okay. This is Michael Jordan for me. And he (laughs) overheard me having this conversation. He he travels like with the chief of staff a lot of times. So he started raising your voice a little like, okay, I'm going to be honest. I started raising my (laughs) voice a little bit. He heard what I was saying. He knew I was kind of talking about hotels and, uh, he had this guy come up to me. He's like, who are you? You know, I was like, And I kind of, I'm like, oh, I'm sure you want to know because I saw Barry lurking behind him. And we said hello. We talked for three minutes. The next day, um, I happened to go out by the pool to to read or do some work around uh, three o'clock. And it was this weird time at the pool where there was like only like four lounge chairs in the sun. And I took one of them and then Barry comes strolling out and he has to sit right next to me. So I'm like, here we go. Here we go. Let's do it. So we have a great conversation. Um, Barry moved to, he was living in Miami. I was living in Florida as well. So I'm like, all right, we're staying in touch. This is, this is awesome. And then we kept talking and it eventually evolved into conversations where he's like, hey, why don't you do kind of what you're doing for your business for me? And let's try it out and, and see what works. And forever grateful for him giving the opportunity, but more so grateful for, you know, his friendship, because that's the most that I'm going to take away. It's not just the deal. It's, you know, the mentorship, the friendship that will carry on. Okay. So, and, and can you describe at a high level? I'm not asking for details. When you decide to work with them, your role is X and their role is what? So on the two deals that we did that were very similar, we were basically like a sliver equity partner. Okay. um, Where some of our sweat equity, you know, converted to equity based on a certain return. And um, we had development fees that that was those two projects. Um, And was there already a building in place? Are you going out of the ground with this thing? So one deal, we were going out of the ground, we were working in California doing entitlements for three years. That was a big project. And then COVID hit, you know, that was challenging. Yeah. The other deal, he they bought this incredible hotel in West Hollywood, which would soon become the one West Hollywood. Yeah. It had it lacked any soul, terrible design, brand new, beautiful building in the best location in uh, essentially LA. And came in and executed the conversion to one on a very tight budget. And it was a lot of fun, a lot of travel. And the product turned out amazing. And now the hotel is ripping and doing incredibly well. And then um, the third deal, we uh, are joint venture partners together. I've been to the one in Miami. So I'll just give you, I've been there twice. And I guess the things I remember are uh, pulling in is pretty cool, especially in Miami, because there's all these, you know, crazy folks and cars. And it's just like a scene, just like getting out of LA. Yeah. Then you walk in, there was a, I recall, there's a lot of lounge seats to your left. And a lot of people like during the day are out there working, but I don't even know if they're staying at the hotel. Like there's just people like it was a work kind of 
then you get these keys that are like little wooden circles yep. that I'll never forget. That's the thing that weirdly I like. I, you just tap that thing everywhere you go. Rooms were awesome. There was like a divider in the middle of the room that like separated this little living room, but the divider was like the size of the bed. Yep. So you could just put stuff on it while you're laying in bed, which I thought was huge. Um, huge shower. Huge shower. Yeah. Walk in the shower. Um, I won't say anything X rated. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the people were amazing. Went to the rooftop, uh, like it was like sushi and a cool vibe. And it was Great on like pool. a Tuesday night and it was bumping. People are oh, getting the, bottles oh, and they have cabanas. On like Tuesday, Wednesday, we were there for a work deal. Pool, amazing. You could walk down to the beach. There was, I mean, it was it was awesome. I mean, it was one of my favorite hotel stays that I've been to. In my mind, having a hotel like that is the ultimate goal or having resorts is the ultimate goal because it's really where you have such a captive audience and you could generate so much revenue if you're doing things right. You can have a big group convention going on with a bunch of guys in suits from Goldman Sachs, and then you can have some swimsuit model fashion show thing going on, and then they all converge and you're charging all of them a ton of money. You're in a great location. Resorts are just are so good. And what they created in that hotel is phenomenal. And it was a lot of struggle. I mean, you know, it was came out of the great financial crisis. They were, I think, over budget and they created one of the most successful, probably the most successful hotel in Miami Beach, sold it for a ton of money. I mean, it's so successful. The new buyer, which everyone thought paid a lot of money, is now so money good and is making tremendous amount of money. But what it also did is it put that brand on such a high pedestal that it became the calling card and everyone wanted to work with Barry anyways, but now everyone can see what they could create and what they could do. By the way, on that key card, I actually saw something cooler recently. So they now have little stickers that they can put on the back of your phone that does the same thing. That's so you can get into the room, like everyone has their phone, you lose your key every time. And you just put your phone to the thing and it opens up. So I, that's the new one. There is nothing more annoying yeah. than the card, like the plastic card not working. Like maybe it works the first couple of times. You go all the way up to your room and then it ain't working. And you got to go down and you got to get a new one. Or hopefully there's housekeeping on that level, which maybe you should tell me like, should housekeeping let me in? Is That's a security risk, Chris. Because usually I'll be like, can you please let me in? Yeah, they'll let me in. Yeah. But then I'm thinking... I could have gone into any one of these rooms. A hundred percent. Yeah. I think it's the Texas accent. Yeah. No, it's it, it's definitely the Texas accent. Um, but what the other thing learned I learned from Barry is that you can have the greatest deal, but if you suck at structuring, yeah, that deal's not good. And there are a lot of people in the hospitality business that have great hotels from the outside. It looks like a great business, but they don't have a good structure. So they're you know, someone might make money, but the sponsor is probably not going to make any money. And the setup isn't as good as it could have been. So are you in the real estate business or are you in the hospitality business? We're both. But like, which one do you have to be better at? Like, which one can sink you? The hospitality business can sink you because yeah. if Hospitality investments are made based on the net income of the business. And if you screw that up, your value is going down. Okay. So you have the operating business that's making money from the bar and the upsells in the room. And, and if you offer dry cleaning and you know all the stuff, are y'all also owning the restaurants in these high lifestyles? Or are you now partnering with restaurant operators like... How do you think about that? When I walk into these, I sometimes don't know who owns this thing. Well, that's a good one. So we like to, we operate all of our food and beverage today. Mm -hmm. That's one of our skills. We excel in that. But we also want people to think that we don't operate it, that it's someone else. Because people have a stigma about going into a hotel restaurant, particularly if you have to walk through a lobby or there's a challenge to get there. However, we are definitely open to working with a killer in a certain market and structuring a deal. A lot of deals were management contracts or leases, but there's a lot of misalignment there. What some of the smarter brands are doing now is they either form a joint venture or they do it in a consulting agreement where you 
consult with a great local chef and restaurateur, and he creates the menu and the service standards and a lot of the culture and the uniforms and all the hard stuff. But the staff all works for you, so you can flex that P&L as you need, but the essence still really feels very independent from the hotel. And that's been a very successful model, particularly in restaurants that are make a lot of money because then that'll come to the hotel owner, which put up all the cost. What's the greatest hotel in the world? Oh, wow. Um, I like the Hotel Bel Air for a luxury experience in the United States, in California. I think it's phenomenal. It's a piece of real estate that could never be recreated ever again. And then I really love this hotel that was owned by a, a friend of mine that passed recently, an icon in the hotel industry called Brush Creek Ranch. And I it's basically, planned. you did? Yeah. Oh man, Wyoming. how cool is that? Unbelievable. So that is basically, you know, was Bruce White's he personal passed? playground. Yeah. Recently, what? like what happened? a month ago, he was sick. He was young. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't like old. No, no. Man, I'm sorry. And he was uh, an icon, but that to me is like end goal. You know, you have your ranch and you have this great, dude ranch that you've created for others to experience. But then the great thing that happened to his benefit during COVID, they started making a ton of money. It like used to be a loss leader. It used to be a passion project. So that to me is, is definitely a favorite hotel. And then there's, you know, there's so many smaller hotels that just do things really well. One thing that I'm starting to appreciate a lot more than I ever have is scale. So size to me is starting to be a turnoff. I think size in a resort because it's spread out and there's a lot of amenities, that's fine. But these big city hotels, I'm less interested in. I'm more interested in the ones that are small that feel like you have this living room or this private club environment. That's where the biggest opportunity is. You ever stayed at Blackberry Farms? Haven't stayed there. I haven't either, but I've heard it's like the sister to Brush Creek uh, Ranch. It is just, yeah, way more probably elevated and polished, but they have dialed in hospitality from what I've heard to the next level. So much so where they're selling people the Kool-Aid. You can buy a Blackberry Farm ranch, like a house. They even sell Blackberry Farm dogs now. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> um, but like the design aesthetic there, this residential feeling and probably how they make each guest feel is why... It's so successful. And the great thing about those assets is you don't need to renovate them every seven years to come up with something new. Yeah. You just got to do one little thing different every single time and keep improving and compounding on that. So that's the fun stuff. But I think you got to have a mix of those and you got to have a mix of our deals that we buy at a discount that are just value added. They're just fucking smart and make a lot of money. Yeah. And we layer those in. Too many people, I think, get like, focused on like, oh, I'm only the cool guy. I'm only going to do these cool hotels. Those are great. You can make money on those. But why exclude enhancing something that may be a little bit more basic or might be a little bit more down the fairway and you can still crush those deals too. So we like doing both. Cool. And on those deals, we, we talked about it on those value add deals. Those are typically not going to be like a lifestyle property. You're more buying like a it could be. Okay. Yeah, it could be. So like even on our ones that we like, we just bought a double tree recently. We're going to make it one of the coolest double trees out there. We're adding a bar out by the pool. Uh, we're adding an arcade for kids. We're redoing the lobby and the lobby looks like as it's in Boca Raton. The lobby looks as good as any hotel in Boca. It will look. The renderings look that way. And that's the goal. So we're elevating it to a level because some of these hotels don't have a rate ceiling. So you can just charge if you're offering a better product. And um, investors love those deals too because they are, you know, so easy to explain. Yeah. Because you just walk in the hotel, and it's like everyone can see that it sucks now, and you could show them what it's going to be. All right, let's just kind of bring it home on um, interest rates up, but the hotel industry just went through COVID. They have their battle scars. They've gotten tough. Um, what is what do you think hotels look like as an investable asset class over the next like five years? Is it well, if you look at you know long term rates, yeah, they're an inch and inflation. It's at, like if you look at the ten year break even inflation rate, it's going to come back down over the next ten years. Going to average below three percent. 
according to the St. Louis Fed, which puts out this data. And if you look at the 10-year, that's probably a good hedge about where the Fed funds rate is going to be over time. But right now, it is tough. Yeah. Like we have caps that are cooking, that are kicking in. Like we've never had a cap that kicked in before. And now we're getting paid there. We are selling two hotels right now with in-place debt. And that just seems like a credible opportunity for someone because they're going to pay a lower interest than anyone else would pay on a new deal. For me, though, it's hard to, I would think in a new deal, you have to do floating right now because we're probably closer to the peak than the trough. Yeah. And that might pay. But um, this is going to be the one-two punch for hospitality. Like we're seeing it. We, you know, we have one or two hotels right now where it's like literally some of our cash flow just almost all the way evaporated because we're paying double or triple interest based on how quickly rates have risen. Barry has been very outspoken about this. And uh, you know, we're gonna have to go have conversations with banks again. And the conversation is very different because no one underwrote this and no one expected this to happen this quickly. And this is where some compromises I think are gonna happen because it's not something that the real estate investor, the operator is doing wrong. I also don't know that it's a long-term thing, but there's a lot of conversation on Twitter about like, everyone is the smartest guy in the world on Twitter. And- uh, I've been calling this since 2015. Everyone's been calling it. Everyone knows. And by the way, everyone has plenty of capital ready to deploy. Mm -hmm. Like everyone is ready to do that apparently, which I find interesting. But this whole pencils down mentality, I think as real estate investors and operators, we need to find ways to make money and find deals in all markets. Like you look at like Sam Zell came out of an interest rate environment that was like 17, 16%. I mean, he was able to figure it out. We should, you and I should be able to figure out in our specialty, in our vertical, how to do successful deals during this time. And maybe that means you structure it a little bit differently. You're a little bit slower. You buy it at a bigger discount. But I don't think it just means you sit around and do nothing and wait for a fund to start acting. I think we got to be the first mover and let the funds follow, like the institutions follow. I agree. Is is there anything as you look out on the horizon, uh, maybe it's technology, maybe it's just new products. Is there any new revenue streams or ways to cut costs that are glaringly obvious or that are coming as AI or is there anything that's going to make running a hotel business, um, you know, more profitable that's not currently in play? I think AI will help revenue management. The other thing, I think remote work is also going to help hospitality because payroll is our biggest expense. So what jobs could we do in another country that we're currently doing here, I think is a way to excel. Like hotels are literally stuck 20 years ago. Mm. So like new technology in hotels was available everywhere else, you know, five, 10 years ago. It's just deploying them. So that's that's an opportunity um, that I would see. And, and the biggest opportunity I see in this environment is to raise money and we are raising a new fund. We're going to start raising in probably a month or two to get ready so that you are ready for the deals and the opportunities that might come and you're not having to raise capital also trying to source deals. Right. All right, my man. This was fun. Yeah. Congrats on... uh... You're super impressive, by the way. I had the opportunity to walk through your whole office and I am blown away by the level at which you're operating on, how you think of the world, personally, professionally. I appreciate it. Glad to count you as a good friend now. I, I Same thing. Uh, it's been a joy to get to know you. I look forward to seeing your digs whenever I get out to Florida. You're going to come. Um, but thank you for coming to mine and and for, for what you saw. Appreciate you. Thanks, Jake. Thanks.